it's this is I get emotional when I talk about Japan. Um, as I did my organs and always cried. I always had dirt in my eyes when I talked about Japan. Um, so you know, I'm just so great. This is Amy Purdy, a snowboarding fanatic. She nearly died when she was 19. She lost her spleen and both kidneys to bacterial meningitis. She also lost her legs below the knee. But now she's a Paralympics medalist who helps other disabled athletes get into action sports. And she's just a super inspiring person to talk to. So why does talking about Toyota make her cry? We'll come back to her story because in this video, I'm going to dive into the big business of Olympic Games sponsorship. We're going to look at the big money numbers, find out what global brands have to do as part of the games, and figure out what they get in return using Toyota as a case study, reportedly the biggest ever sponsor of the games, as well as the first car company to be an Olympics partner. First up, here's a quick look at Toyota's involvement. No official number has ever been given, but the widely reported number is 835 million US dollars for a deal signed in 2015. For the Paris Games, that includes 2,650 vehicles. That's made up of more than a thousand electric cars from Toyota and Lexus and vans like this one that took me to my hotel. It also includes 500 hydrogen fuel cell cars called the Mirai 845 hybrid vehicles and 176 plug-in hybrids. There's more. There's also 250 of these electric accessible people movers, which Toyota hasn't even figured out what to do with after the games are over. Toyota also gives financial support to a whopping 250 athletes from 49 countries. So here I am in Paris. I won't actually be watching any of the sporting events, but I am a guest of Toyota, and they've been a sponsor of the Summer Games, the Winter Games, and the Paralympic Games since 2015 when they signed on. I'll be watching the opening ceremony. I'm going to check out some corporate hospitality, and I'm here to find out what exactly the world's biggest car company wants to get out of sponsoring the Olympic Games. For a start, the Games are organized by the International Olympic Committee, or IOC, which manages the TOP program. That stands for the Olympic Partner Program. That's the highest level of Olympic sponsorship, and it gives companies global marketing rights across all Olympic Games. There's basically four main reasons that companies sign on with the TOP program. First, the Olympics pull in a massive audience from all over the globe, giving sponsors some serious exposure. Second, they're basically the most prestigious global sporting event by far. Everybody marks themselves against the Olympic champion. What's interesting is if you win um, a gold medal in athletics, or you win a gold medal in um, even basketball in the world championships uh, and so on, it still doesn't add up to what you win as an Olympic champion. That's what matters. And, you know, taking again the sport of athletics, even though they're great athletes, they have world championships, people follow it. Um, if you win that gold medal, you're a step above. Plus it's global. Very few sports properties are global and they can use it anywhere in the world. Sponsors also provide goods and services essential to the operation of the games. They receive recognition as official suppliers, so they get branding opportunities related to the services they provide, and they're associated with the operational success of the games, if everything goes well. The fourth reason is corporate hospitality. Sponsors get to offer exclusive experiences to clients and partners, which is great for building relationships and boosting business opportunities. And that's kind of how I ended up in Paris. I have some great friends at Toyota. Motor Asia, just like my good friend Jaja Ishibashi. Hey, Jaja, let me ask you something. Yeah, yeah sure. Good friend and camera monkey. Uh, why did you invite me to Paris? Why did I invite you to Paris? Well, you know a lot about SYI, right? And at Toyota, we talk a lot about the Gemba. So we wanted you to know more. And also, I don't have PPS anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, whatever it takes, at least it gives me the chance to uh, show you some hospitality. Welcome to Toyota House. It's right in the heart of Paris and walking distance to many of the sporting venues. It has great views of the River Seine, as well as a certain Paris landmark. On one level, it's a networking space where guests can grab a cup of coffee, have a bite, and basically hang out and maybe talk some business. But corporate hospitality is really about creating an amazing experience for partners. The, the hospitality programs are, are, are among the most important programs as a part of a, a brand's presence at, these, at, at games. You know, there was one time when I was um, at an event where, and it was in Beijing, and 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 the U.S. and, and one of the fencing women events, they won uh, bronze, silver, and gold, and it was not supposed to happen. It was just in such an amazing experience, even though not everybody was American; they were from all over the world. And then the next day, those three winners came with their medals, let everybody put them on, touch them, and 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 feel it. So the disparity between 
watching it on TV and being there in person is is just um, it, it, you can't compare. So I've talked to people who went on hospitality programs that I've managed, and they still talk about these 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 small things, whether it's a small gift or or getting to shake the hand of a, an Olympian. For them, it was like um, a lifetime memory. And so that's what hospitality is all about, is taking your most important clients, your most important partners, your executives, and creating memories for a lifetime. And this place looks kind of fancy, doesn't it? It's just one reminder that anything to do with the games is all about big money. Exactly how big? Well, according to the IOC, here's how the numbers work out. The Paris 2024 Organizing Committee budget is 4.38 billion euros. Here's where the money comes from. The IOC chips in 1.2 billion euros. It gets most of its money from TV rights, which is the single biggest source of income for the IOC at 750 million euros. Then there's TOP partnerships, which add 470 million euros. Ticket sales are huge, bringing in 1.1 billion euros. Then there's hospitality and licensing revenue, which adds 170 million and 127 million respectively. Partnerships and other revenue bring 1.226 billion and 193 million euros to the table. Here's the interesting part. The IOC says the games are almost entirely privately funded with just 4% of public funding needed to organize the Paralympic Games. According to the IOC, the games finance themselves. But I don't think that's the whole story because there's the operating budget and then there's the infrastructure budget and that's where things can really get out of control. According to research by Oxford University, every Olympic game since 1960 has run over budget. Exact figures are impossible to come by, but let's have a look at some recent games. According to data from the Council of Foreign Relations, London budgeted 5 billion US dollars for the 2012 Summer Games, but ended up spending 18 billion. Notoriously, the 2014 Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia were supposed to cost 10.3 billion, but ended up costing more than 51 billion. Tokyo said it would spend 7.3 billion for the pandemic-delayed games in 2021, but a 2019 government audit said the actual was looking more like 28 billion. Yikes. Understandably, ordinary citizens are less than thrilled about this because they're the ones that are stuck with the bill long after the games are over. The most notorious example of this could be the 1976 Summer Games in Montreal. The Canadian city thought the games would cost just 124 million, but ended up spending billions. A huge part of that was for a shiny new Olympic stadium nicknamed the Big O because of its donut-shaped roof. It's actually kind of cool and it has the world's tallest slanted tower, which they only finished building a full 10 years after the stadium opened, by the way. But locals nicknamed the place the Big O because it took taxpayers 30 years to finish paying for the facility. And believe it or not, it's still a money pit. Just this year, the tourism minister of Quebec announced it would cost 870 million to replace the Big O's roof, giving it its third roof. Again, yikes. But I digress. Paris is reportedly spending around 5.5 billion euros on infrastructure, which seems a little on the low side. Then again, the city already had big sports venues before the Olympics, like the Stade de France and the Roland Garros Stadium, which has 20 tennis courts. The main projects in the budget include the Olympic Village, where the athletes stay, an Olympic Aquatic Center, and a new 8,000-seat arena, with plans to reuse them after the games are over. But the budget doesn't include everything, like the cost of refurbishing older buildings, the estimated 40,000 security personnel deployed to keep the game safe, or the 1.4 billion it cost to clean up the River Seine so that athletes could swim in it. But what about all that sweet, sweet tourism money? All the jobs created, all the long-term benefits of sprucing up the city for the Olympic Games? Well, one study published in the Journal of Economic Perspectives concluded that the economic benefits are, quote, either near zero or a fraction of that predicted prior to the event. And that is why everyone hates economists. But there is an argument that the buildings and facilities that are built for the games can be repurposed for other uses later on, or that they'll be around for decades for people to enjoy. Predictably, it hasn't always turned out that way. Many big projects become white elephants and fall into disrepair as little as one year after the games are over. Some need expensive upkeep, some just don't see any action, and some are outright abandoned. Still, the 2024 games are just a great ad for Paris, with many landmarks serving as the backdrop for sporting events, like beach volleyball right at the foot of the Eiffel Tower, or the swimming part of the triathlon down the River Seine, or equestrian competition in the sprawling gardens of Versailles Palace. There's just a beauty to the city that makes it such a cool place to host the games. That brings me back to Toyota House, which is kind of where it all comes together in terms of messaging. Here's where Toyota is showcasing what its long-term strategy is about 
and showing off the technologies it's working on to make that happen, like hydrogen fuel cells and yes, electric cars. There's even talks by Toyota's senior leadership. That's Gil Pratt, the CEO of Toyota Research Institute and a man that Akio Toyota thinks of as a genius. Then of course, there's a showcase of the global team Toyota athletes. In my part of the world, Asia, Toyota supports 11 athletes across nine markets and calls them dual heroes because they champion both sports and social causes with local communities. But everything you see here all comes down to one slogan. Start your impossible. Start your impossible. Start your impossible. You see this pretty much everywhere. There's some Toyota presence or branding, but what does it actually mean? So Start Your Impossible is a movement. It's a movement for inspiration for all of us, employees, the public, stakeholders, and it's an inspiration to do something you cannot achieve, to make it attainable. That's Start Your Impossible. Toyota launched it in 2017 as a way to affirm its dedication to mobility for all, but also to galvanize Toyota itself into transforming from a traditional car manufacturer to a mobility company dedicated to creating solutions that support a more inclusive and sustainable society, which really ties in with Olympic messaging. And here's where Toyota's partnership with the Olympics and especially the Paralympic Games really comes to life. This mobility park is a pop-up where Toyota is giving the public the chance to get up close with all kinds of mobility gadgets, like this autonomous wheelchair that's already in use in some airports to take passengers around, or these walkers to help athletes, staff, and volunteers move around efficiently and safely then there's these electric wheelchair e-pullers, which convert manual wheelchairs into battery-powered mobility solutions. Toyota's making 200 of them available in the Paralympic Village and during the opening ceremony. There's all kinds of different mobility that we want to provide for everyone. And by everyone, I mean people of all ages and people that geographically are anywhere in the world. And even this kind of new idea, which is not only out on the roads outside, but also inside of homes. At the end of the day, I think what Toyota's example shows is that large corporations don't just get a dose of prestige and global exposure from the games, but it allows them to solidify and amplify some important messaging. Whether that messaging is all around sustainability, like with hydrogen cars, or around inclusivity, like with the accessible people movers, or maybe around something bigger and more noble and more inspiring. So gosh, I think Start Your Impossible means do the thing that you want to do before stopping yourself from doing it. You know, we all have big dreams and big goals, but we stop ourselves from doing it because we think there's a reason we can't do it. So I think it's a matter of just like really believe in yourself so that you can take that first step and follow your passion and just not let your fears um, stop you from, from doing it. It's, it's starting the thing that you really want to do and knowing and believing in your heart that you can do it.